Uh, since we have a lot of new faces today, just a quick intro we don't normally do. Uh, this is our uh, safety peer group. Uh, this is an OSHA alliance. Uh, we signed an agreement with OSHA. We put this on once a quarter. There's never any charge. We have uh, some breakfast in the back and the idea uh, behind the name, it's safety peer. Uh, so this room is full of people who are experts in health and safety uh, for their own companies. Uh, we put on presentations. We'd like to not just do it ourselves with LVHN personnel, although we have some very knowledgeable colleagues. Uh, we also like to bring in people outside to share uh, their years of experience and knowledge base. And the idea is hopefully we can share some ideas with each other that we can all walk away with something uh, that we can apply. Uh, okay, what else did I? Well, that was a good. That was my intro. Okay. Uh, so the the topic today is combating workers' comp abuse legally, but there's been like an article or two about uh, a medical uh, issue that's going on. So we're going to start just take five minutes away from the actual uh, ta uh, the actual presentation. And Dr. Dolphin, who's our medical director at HealthWorks, we have Alley Health Network. He's uh, been doing this uh, for years. Uh, but I, I'm going to ask uh, Dr. Dolphin to come up. We're just going to give just a quick two, three minutes on uh, what's going on with coronavirus and the latest. Since uh, all these media experts love to talk about it, we thought an actual doctor could talk about it. And uh, we'll go from there. <laughs> That's a picture of the coronavirus. It is not found in Corona beer. Uh, I guess there's been a 38% uh, 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 of people won't drink Corona beer because they're afraid of coronavirus. Uh, I was listening to uh, the news yesterday and uh, 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 the mayor of New York was talking about what New York was doing, New York City, and he said, oh, it's not airborne. Well, you know, there's a lot of misinformation out there. A lot of non-medical people are uh, weighing in. Uh, it is an airborne disease. It's also caused by touching surfaces that could get contaminated. I think that the genie is out of the bottle. Uh, the initial plan was to uh, 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 encircle anybody who had the uh, uh, disease and trace all contacts and isolate those people so it could spread no further. Unfortunately, uh, there are a lot, of, well, not completely unfortunately, but there are a lot of uh, people who have little, if any, symptoms, but still are able to transmit the disease so people can get exposed and not be aware of it. So the basic tenets of uh, public health are very important that uh, we have to wash our hands. And for this, sanitizers are particularly effective. I guess there was one uh, uh, vodka producer who said, we can't use our vodka to, uh, uh, clean your hands because we're not 65% uh, alcohol. So maybe 151 rum would work, but uh, uh, the uh, 60, uh, the regular vodka is not good enough. So frequent uh, uh, washing your hands, not trying to touch surfaces, keeping your hands away from your uh, uh, face and nose and mouth and, and maybe even eyes. Uh, handshaking probably should uh, be gone away from now because that's an effective way to transmit the disease. Uh, uh, and uh, mass gatherings <laughs> uh, <laughs> can be an issue. Uh, again, if somebody doesn't have the disease, they can't transmit the disease. I think sometimes people forget that too. Uh, uh, so uh, um, it just keep uh, 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 Cleanliness in mind, washing your hands uh, can't be uh, uh, overstated. Uh, uh, does anybody have any questions? Giving numbers of how many people are infected seems to be a useless thing because it changes every day. Yeah, the numbers go up. I understand in China, maybe uh, things are going down. So maybe this won't go on terribly much longer. Maybe warm weather will have an effect. Uh, this is this virus is in a family of viruses that cause the common cold. Uh, it's just that these new ones are particularly uh, dangerous to certain groups, particularly with uh, high risk conditions in the elderly. He had his hands up for us, so we'll go. Yeah, actually, it's more of a statement versus a question. Signal if everyone in the room here knew that those were happening, they would have 
statement regarding this that they can actually come back and work to maybe injure it. Uh, it's actually considered a what's called illness, and uh, that's going to open up a whole can of beans. Scott, do you uh, have anything to add to that? Good morning, everyone. Uh, so this is not unlike any of other conditions that may be communicable in the workplace. Uh, for girls, it's not. If we can identify that the condition was created in the workplace, and that I got it from somebody else at work, and I go and get treated because now I have coronavirus because my workplace gave it to me. But Okay, thank you. Your neighbor. Yesterday, from what I understand, the CDC Well, it, there are, uh, I, I consider when there are particles, it, it is particle borne. So if you sneeze into the air or cough into the air, there are particles that go into the air. And I, I consider that airborne. If you, uh, are, are uh, trying to say that uh, an exhaled breath uh, uh, contains that that may not be true. But I, 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 I think it would be a mistake to tell people that uh, it's only from touching surfaces or uh, and then touching your, your mouth or eyes or nose. So you can uh, be in a room with people, not touch anything. And if they're coughing or sneezing, you can become infected. That's right. That's right. Okay. Anything else? All right, John. Yes. Two points of order, workers' compensation. So we've been asked that question a lot, John. Okay, sure. Uh, could, could you ask our um, insurance carriers that question? Um, and we have not received any definitive guidance from them. Uh, you can imagine an insurance company likes predictability and understanding what the issue is before they'll make a stance. Um, I can tell you that um, it may be recordable, but it may not be compensable um, under the statute. Um, I did a little research into that. Um, there is a section where in the statute, the work comp statute in Pennsylvania that defines um, occupational disease. Um, I, I, there is a section in there that's kind of broad that if your employment puts you at greater risk than the average public, it may be compensable there. It doesn't define what that, there, there's no, it's not like it's defining black lung or ciliosis or something like that. Um, so healthcare providers, first responders, um, I would try and argue that it would be compensable under that, but where you're going to have difficulty is, is actually tying it to the workplace. Um, it, it's going to have to be pretty definitive. So I hate to be vague, but that's, that's where we are right now. Yes. <laughs> I just, I just wanted to comment on the issue. 
uh, from the legal standpoint, is this a good place for you? Yes. Um, what we're advising clients right now, because of the uncertainty with the workers' comp system, is just to exercise what is known legally as a reasonable standard of care. That doesn't mean that you have to cover all your employees with hand sanitizer or require them never to look at or touch a colleague. What that simply means is that you need to take reasonable precautions, such as warning employees about the possible risk. And if you have employees who normally travel overseas, to limit overseas travel in a reasonable manner. So the law puts the burden on you to simply act reasonably in times where there's a pandemic. And another example of reasonable care would be to obtain a copy of the CDC's recommendations and make sure you're putting those recommendations into practice in your work. Then you should be in compliance with a reasonable standard of care. And of course, I have to give the normal lawyer pitch to document all your all your effort to comply. Thank you. Uh, uh, as we're listening to moderate, if you are speaking, uh, if you're trying to pursue your page of what company you're with, and I ask you all to your With that, I think we're ready to go on to uh, the document. So, uh, my name is John Eltringham. I'm with HMK Insurance. Um, I'm a commercial producer there and partner in the firm. Um, I'm going to talk to you today about, uh, you know, attempting to reduce um, workers' comp abuse. I would hope it also just ties into reducing your overall cost of workers' compensation. They're, they're, they kind of go hand in hand. Um, I told a couple clients in mine here, there's probably a talk that I've had with them every year for the last 15 or 20 years. Um, they're kind of basic building blocks. So I think it's a good place to start. Um, and if they are basic things that you've seen before, um, I apologize for that, but it's also good to reinforce them because it seems in my experience, although we understand these things, we kind of lose track of them and don't, don't readily utilize the tools that we have as employers. Um, it's a little hard to see, but HMK has been in Bethlehem. We were founded in 1914. Um, we have over 60 employees. Um, we generate about a half a billion dollars a year in revenue through an organization that we're connected to called the Alera Group. Um, that map down there in the bottom right hand corner shows you where uh, our over 70 offices and 1,800 employees are located. Um, the goal of, of our organization is to just to provide better outcomes to our clients. Uh, through consultative services, risk management, financial services, employee benefits. Um, so that's who we are um, in the nutshell. I've been in the business for over 25 years um, with my clients on workers' compensation and other lines of insurance. So I, would, I thought it'd be good just to show you some statistics uh, about workers' compensation specific to Pennsylvania. You know, it's funny. I just thought that throw a little humor in there. Facts are stubborn things, but statistics are pliable. I don't know that they really are with workers' compensation. The numbers are real. And honestly, I never dug into it as deeply as I did in preparation for this. So um, it was kind of shocking to me. But in 2017, and this is based on the Department of Labor's workers' compensation study. Um, I haven't seen 18s yet. It hasn't been out yet. Um, hasn't been produced yet. But in 2017, there were 173,000 uh, workers' comp cases reported in the state of Pennsylvania. It's down by almost a thousand, which is good, um, but it's still a pretty staggering number. Just to kind of give you a little local flavor, Lehigh County had 4,307 cases and Northampton County 2,750. Um, not sure their populations are similar. There's more businesses in uh, in Lehigh County, so that could account for the difference. But that's a pretty significant difference when you look at it. Um, Comp payments, work comp payments, $2,787,000. That's a lot of money going out for, you know, a billion dollars in indemnity, almost a billion and a half, and three in medical. Um, pretty staggering numbers when you think about it. Uh, again, good news is it's down from the 16 numbers. Be interested to see what happens in uh, the 18 as it comes forward. Um, the impact, if you want to account for fraud, uh, there was a study done by Employers Insurance. They're a workers' compensation only carrier, um, and they estimate that one to two percent of workers' comp claims are fraudulent. So, it's not 
all of your employees. It's not all of your claimants. I know sometimes it feels like that. We like to pitch in it whole everybody as you're using the system. Um, and I have to tell you, you know, we all have our, our horror stories of, you know, employee that I have. Uh, one of my favorites is a, a guy with a head injury that, um, you know, we found out that he was competing in an MMA competition, you know, stuff like that. Um, but transposed against that is I had a horrible industrial accident where a man was literally picked up by a piece of production equipment and massive injuries. Um, life-threatening injuries. The work comp, oh, it, it saved his life. It gave him the medical treatment that he needed. It gave him the income that he needed. It's a scary time for your employees when they report an injury. So don't don't forget that part of it. It's, it's there and it does a very valuable service as well. Um, but if you if you calculate the the cost, you know if we take the worst case scenario, looking at over fifty five million dollars in fraudulent payments. In 2017, and you all in this room are paying for that. That's baked into the rates that you pay. That's baked into your experience modification factor. Um, so it does affect you um, directly. Um, I thought it'd also be helpful just to kind of remind you and maybe point some things out as you have an employee that you might think um, is going to present a problem to you. It's always good to kind of get out ahead of it. Um, just what are the warning signs? What are the things that we know over the course of, of the history of workers' compensation can kind of point you to that one employee or that uh, group of employees that might be trying to uh, take advantage of the situation? Um, Monday morning injuries, you know, first thing Monday morning um, or the, you know, I was injured on Friday and I didn't tell you about it because I didn't think it was that bad. But then the weekend went around and now I'm, I know I'm hurt. Um, that's a pretty good indicator that there might be something going on there. Um, it's not so prevalent now, but we used to see a spike in work comp cases right before deer season. It's an interesting statistic. Um, employment changes. Um, you know, the alleged injury occurs immediately before or after a job termination and the seasonal work. Your employees, if, if you're planning on a workforce reduction, believe me, you can try and keep it under your hat, but it's it's out there. They know it's coming. Um, we've also had uh, individuals terminate and then retroactively submit a claim. That's a huge red flag. And they can do that. Under the statute, it's legal. It's, it's there for them to take advantage of. Um, suspicious providers, either in the healthcare arena or legal, um, I put a, a note there, ask your claims adjuster. If they've been around for a while, they know who the suspects are, the healthcare provider, the attorney, uh, the chiropractor, the, you know, uh, those types of, of they'll, they'll tell you, they'll help you understand whether you're looking at an issue coming down the road. Um, you know, this is a big one, no witnesses. You know, I fell out, it's third shift. I fell out in the warehouse. Nobody saw it. Seeing those eliminated a little bit or having or reducing uh, folks are taking advantage of cheaper surveillance technology, able to put it out in the warehouse or, you know, uh, even in offices, exterior of the building, um, that type of thing. I can tell you how many claims we see where people, you know, employees slip and fall, you know, on their way into work or their way home from work. You know, there you own them when they pull onto the parking lot until they exit the, the parking lot. They're yours. Um, Conflicting descriptions, you know, things just don't match up with what you said happened and what you're claiming your injury is. Don't quite know. Um, that's a that's a common one as well. Um, you know, unfortunately in Pennsylvania, we can't obtain prior workers' compensation uh, claims history. You can't ask for it. Um, once a claim's been submitted, underwriters have a, a or adjusters have the ability to see some some past history. But if you know or you're suspicious they've been involved in litigation before, um, they're probably going to get you again. Um, that, that's if, if that's the case, it's, it's okay to ask about those those issues. You know, we understand you might have been injured before. What's, what's Can you tell me about that? That's okay to, to ask. Um, refusal of treatment. I'm hurt, but I'm okay. I really don't want anything. Don't want anything done. I'm okay. I'm going to move on. Let me just push through this, or I'm just going to go home for a little while. 
I would I would avoid that. Take them to a provider, have them check them out, uh, do your due diligence, and make sure that they're okay. Then reporting, um, again, that kind of ties back with that, um, you know, job change or, or or termination. You can't get in touch with the claimant. They filed the claim. You're trying to call them. You're trying to text them. They aren't responding. Um, that's a very big red flag that you're going to have an issue. Um, changes in their physicians, addresses, jobs, those types of things. Again, big red flags for you. So you have tools at your, uh, at the state, the statute provides that you can take advantage of. Um, and again, you, you should have heard of these from your, uh, your broker or your insurance company, um, but you have the ability to go on the offer. I like Dwight Street, you know, he's always very insightful. The best offense is a good defense. You know, we all know that. And he says, that's not true. The best offense is the best offense. And I think when it comes to workers' compensation, that's very true. Um, it's a lot of effort up front. It might seem like it is, but if you have a case go bad, the work and time and energy and expense that you have to put in on the back end, um, it, it pales in comparison. Um, so report your claims quickly. Most carriers want to see it within three days of the incident. Um, once it goes beyond three days, they know statistically that this thing's going to either get really expensive or um, it's going to go sideways on you. Um, promptly investigate. And when I say investigate, you need to have a procedure in place to really ask the right questions and go through um, an understanding of what led to that accident. Um, I want to talk a little bit about utilizing your risk management uh, resources. Um, Talk about what HMK can do for you there, um, but it's important to to understand how to properly investigate a loss. Um, accompany your injured employee to the medical provider when possible. It's okay to do that if you have the ability to do that. Have the supervisor, someone, drive them there. Help them check in. Speak to the provider. Understand what the situation is. I have a, a client here, um, Morris Black and Sons. They tutored taking their employees when they can, triaging them even before they go, and their incident rate has gone like this. Just that simple. If someone knows my boss is going to take me, it's going to be a little bit of, a, of an, imp uh, an impeding them from, from moving forward sometimes. Um, stay in contact with the medical provider. It's okay to call the physician, say, what's going on with Joe Smith? from you, what's, what's the plan of action? You know, we have light duty, we want to return to work. We really care about Joe, he's an important part of our team. And stay in touch with your injured employee. When someone goes out on workers comp, whether it's you know, I, I, the fraudulent employee, they probably don't really want to hear from you, but you want to stay in touch with them anyway. They want to know that you're looking out for them. They want to know that someone's checking in on them. They want, there's, a, there's accountability there. Um, and for your maybe individual who's not intending on committing fraud, it's amazing how workers' comp claim can turn if we allow Joe Smith to just stay at home and sit on the couch and collect a work comp payment. Um, it gets comfortable for some folks, um, and they might do everything that they can to preserve that lifestyle for as long as they possibly can. Um, so the nuts and bolts uh, of what you can do, what the law or the statute allows you to do. These are a couple of things and your broker's probably hammered it home to you multiple times, but I think the next two are, are the key uh, building block or key tool that you have in, in combating um, fraud. And it, it's, they've been around long enough that the insurance companies know that it does reduce fraud. It not only reduces fraud, it reduces the cost of the claim. Again, that's money out of your pocket. Um, utilizing a physician's panel. So um, under the statute, you're permitted to uh, require your injured worker to treat with physicians and, and providers of your choice for the first 90 days of their, um, their claim. If they refuse to do that, the carrier can refuse to cover the claim. Um, what I'm not recommending to you is establish a provider panel, stick it on the wall, and say, yeah, we have a provider panel. It takes a little bit more work than that. 
um, work with your broker, work with your insurance carrier to make sure that you have the appropriate providers on that panel that are going to um, provide the, the resources to your injured employees that you need. The panel has to be at least six. Uh, there must be at least six providers. Three of them must be physicians. They need to be geographically accessible to your um, employees, and they have to provide services that are pertinent to the types of injuries that they may um, they may sustain. Um, you also have to have the employee sign an acknowledgement at the time of hire and at the time of injury that says, I understand that we're utilizing an, an, a, a physician's panel and I must treat with them. I'm also recommending my clients, if you change your panel, have them sign at that time as well. Um, if it's an emergency system, someone's bleeding and they got to go out in an ambulance, don't need to worry about sticking a piece of paper in front of them and have them signing it again you know, when it's reasonable to do that. Um, and more importantly, probably the, the key to a, a really good physician's panel is talk to your providers. I recommend having a personal meeting face to face with them and telling them who you are, what you do, what types of injuries your employees are kind of used to seeing, um, the types of jobs that you have for a light duty return to work program. Have them understand that they're part of your team in getting your employee back to work. If they don't want to be part of that conversation, I wouldn't recommend utilizing them as a provider. Um, implement a light duty return to work program. I probably get more resistance on this than anything else I recommend to my customers. What can I have my employees do? We don't have anything for Joe to do. You know, he was a mechanic. I can't have him answer the phone. Um, you're not prepared in advance, I can understand that question. You're trying to fix it after it's already been broken. That's usually the response that you get. Um, a good light duty return to work program should be presented to your employees as part of their benefit plan. We, we appreciate you. Um, if you're injured in the line of duty, we want you back. We're gonna do everything we can um, to make that happen for you. Um, again, let your your panel provider know that um, you have that uh, that ability and that willingness. Um, have a 10, 15 job descriptions ready to go. Sit down in advance of an injury and identify things that your employees can do um, before they get injured. Um, every uh, every business has something an employee can do. Um, it has to be meaningful. Um, I had an auto dealership that liked to shame their employees and they put an injured mechanic right in the middle of the shop at a desk with a pile of magazines. That's not a, that's not meaningful. And, uh, they did get their wrist slapped for that. Um, I think a, a, a misunderstanding about, uh, light duty return to work is you must bring the employee back for 40 hours a week at their full pay scale. That's not the case. Um, if you only have a few hours a week, get them back in for a few hours a week. If the job that you're offering them is a minimum wage job, you pay them the minimum wage, the insurance company makes up the difference. So it reduces your out-of-pocket expense. Um, from a fraud standpoint, if you suspect somebody is playing the system, make the light duty return to work um, offer as inconvenient for them as you possibly can. Um, it's okay to say, Joe, we've got restrictions. We've, we've got an, a job for you to do. It's every Monday morning from 6.30 a.m. to 9.30 a.m. And then on Fridays from 4.30 p.m. to 6.30 p.m. If they refuse that, now you have what you need to, for your attorney or for the insurance company's attorney. So we've made an offer, we've extended it, they've refused. We can then petition to suspend uh, or terminate benefits. That ends that situation there. Um, I did not include um, surveillance. Everybody I talk to when they have a fraudulent uh, or suspected fraudulent work comp case, why can't we get surveillance on this guy? We got to get surveillance on this guy. It's probably one of the least effective measures that you can use. It doesn't return a lot unless you have tangible evidence. And I'll go back to my MMA guy. He was actually up on a, a 
website is going to be participating. If you have something like that, boom, yeah, go get them. But if you just have a suspicion that something's happening, you're wasting that that expense. That private detective is coming out of your pocket. Again, unless it's tangible, um, I wouldn't recommend that. Um, work with your risk management team, your broker. We're fortunate at HMK. Jade Simmers over here leads our risk management department, um, along with your broker. Um, can kind of tie all that stuff together. Positions panel, light duty, return to work program, um, accident investigation. I think is huge. Um, it can lead you to understanding, you know, what you've got and what's real, what isn't real. Um, and then finally, I, I think the most important thing where I see claims go sideways is is communication. It's as simple as that. It's not just report the claim, file it, forget it. You stay in touch with your broker partner, your claims rep, your, your agency's claim rep, um, the employee, the healthcare provider. It, it is a job to do, I understand, but it's cheaper to invest there than on the backside when your injured employee uh, seeks legal counsel and then it's over. Um, so that is what I have for you, my contact information. I hope I brought you some value, reminded you of some things that were important um, and will be available for questions. <laughs> a little quick video to start. Set the mood. Here's an ABC News investigation, and it's your money. Millions in taxpayer dollars. The skyrocketing involving workers' compensation. Questionable claims up 24%. Tonight, a contestant on The Price is Right. The problem is, in old work, she was injured. This evening, how she's spinning this now for ABC's Cecilia Vega. <laughs> So uh, uh, not everybody's honest out there, uh, and uh, for not being able to stand, she was able to move pretty quickly. Uh, I just want to say that uh, uh, very often in uh, in the situation when a worker gets hurt, they they're very concerned. They've always heard about people who've been mistreated through the workman's compensation system, and they get worry that they're not going to be treated fairly. Uh, as we heard uh, just before this from John, that the vast majority of people are not trying to pull anything. Uh, uh, they're worried that they might, something bad might happen to them, but uh, uh, the vast majority just want to get better. Uh, I, I often say that I do my job for free, except for the two percent. <laughs> That's what I get paid for. Those people because they they just make life miserable for everyone. Uh, they, uh, some people are not honest. They're uh, looking for something else. They might be looking for a, a job that they would like better. Uh, I, I think uh, modified duty, duty, whatever you want to call it, is very important. And I'm back. Uh, uh, behind it 100 percent but sometimes people find jobs that they like a lot and uh, uh, will want to stay in those jobs 
Uh, some people are just trying to get uh, money for not working. Uh, time at home, they may have family obligations, uh, children or parents that they have to take care of, and uh, it's nothing better than uh, getting paid and staying home at the same time. And sometimes uh, uh, they're trying to avoid disciplinary actions. Okay, they're going to get fired. Uh, oh, I got hurt the day before I was going to be terminated. And uh, that, uh, that's an incentive for people to uh, claim that they've been injured or make their injuries worse than they really are. In general, I believe uh, uh, any patient that comes to me, I believe what they uh, are telling me until I have reason not to believe them. I think it's important to take a, a careful history of how the injury occurred. And uh, uh, then I uh, tried to document it. And, uh, and very often the story I've gotten is different than the story that uh, uh, was told initially uh, to the folks at work. And if there's a discrepancy, that, that's a real problem. Uh, uh, so I, I break it down. There are uh, people who want to get better, uh, and they you, you kind of uh, uh, sometimes even have to, to hold them back uh, because they just want to get back to their job. Uh, then there are the people that are worried. Uh, I have to be a hundred percent in order to get back to my job. Now you don't have to be a hundred percent necessarily, but you have to be able to do everything your job. Requires. At, at, at some point, and we hope to get you to 100%, but you can get back to your uh, regular job if you're at 90% and uh, uh, you don't have to lift 100 pounds, that sort of thing. But sometimes people get in their head, I don't want to go back to work until I'm 100%. Uh, uh, then I often hear people who say, oh, I want to get back to work, I want to get back to work, but every time you try to uh, increase their restrictions, Oh, I, you know, there's always a, a but, uh, and uh, that uh, raises a red flag to me. Oh, I, uh, uh, I'm the best worker there, and uh, I want to get back to work, but uh, 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 their actions don't uh, back up what they say. And then there are people who, uh, like uh, Ms. Cashwell, are trying to pull a fast one. Uh, 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 people who want to get better uh, have a history of what the injury was uh, uh, that uh, matched their physical findings. Uh, uh, usually know exactly what happened. Oh, I fell down and I twisted my ankle and I fell to my left and my ankle went this way. People know what happened to them, but uh, people who are making up a story sometimes are not so clear exactly what happened. It happens so fast, I don't know what went on. That's always uh, makes me wonder because uh, I don't know, the times I've been uh, injured, it's like slow motion that you remember most details of it. Uh, 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 they uh, uh, respond uh, to treatment in expected ways. So uh, you hurt your back, the findings, uh, uh, you know, there, uh, there's not a lot of physical findings in most back aches. Uh, 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 but they all are consistent, move appropriately, and with the time and treatment, they get, they progress and get better in an expected way, rather than people who just don't get better or I've gotten worse. <laughs> now, anybody could uh, 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 have a backslide to get a little bit worse, but these are people who always get worse but seem the same. So those are uh, red flags. Uh, 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 the worried people believe the system is rigged against them. They think that, oh, they're trying to get me and uh, I'm not going to get the proper treatment. I'm not going to uh, uh, be treated in a fair way. And I again, I have to be 100% to get back to work. Uh, uh, and they often express, oh, uh, what if 10 years from now uh, I have another backache? Is it going to be uh, related back to this backache that I now, and I have to tell people, uh, when your backache is gone, you're completely recovered. And I can't say that 10 years from now, you're, if you get a backache, it's because of the backache that you had this time. Uh, um, 
uh, and often, if you can explain to them what's going on, give them reassurance, they do pretty well. With that. Uh, again, there are people that are too eager. They uh, uh, there is often secondary uh, secondary gain to getting back to work early. Uh, they uh, uh, you, you have to uh, uh, be careful about. Uh, Pushing them uh, along too far because they're not quite ready to get back to work. I, you know, I, I'm a, a good person. These are good people who are very eager to get back to work. But sometimes you just have to say, take it a little easy. Uh, uh, they need a realistic plan. And these people are not usually a problem. You just don't want them to uh, hurt themselves by getting back to work uh, full duty too fast. And then uh, the people who are trying to pull a fast one, beg on details uh, as we talk no witnesses. Uh, uh, cameras have been a big help uh, to see exactly how people are injured. Uh, these people, uh, again, have physical findings are consistent with their story. They don't improve uh, secondary gain. Uh, I love to work. I'm the best employee there. And when they're with you in the office, they're very complimentary uh, to the provider. Oh, you're such a good doctor. You've helped me so much. And, what do you mean I helped you so much? You know, it, it just uh, it, uh, you just get the sense that they're trying to butter you up and have you on their side. Uh, uh, and uh, again, they often have uh, uh, human resource issues that they are in trouble for things that they've done at work, and uh, they're trying to uh, find a way out of uh, of being fired or having uh, an action against them. It's not always easy uh, for a doctor to tell who's not being honest. You can put all these things together and get concerned. I think communication with the employer is uh, uh, very helpful. We have a case manager that uh, I speak with to, uh, with all the time and she communicates with the company. And I think that uh, exchange of uh, information is very helpful. A lot of times I get information even before I see the patient that all oh, there are these issues and I listen to those. I, I can't always just take them 100% and say, oh yeah, you're faking it because I heard from the company. I still have to listen and examine the patient, but that, that at least gives us some idea uh, of what's going on and that's very helpful. So if you have suspicions, uh, let us let the provider know. I think that, uh, that, that can only help the more information Doctors like data, the more information they have, the better they are. Uh, uh, so, and reducing secondary gain, making modified work available. Uh, I, I, and we would like people to do meaningful work. So keep their job, if you can, as close to their regular job and uh, uh, as possible. And uh, uh, they also need to keep uh, their treatments and their appointments. When people aren't showing up, that's another red flag. So uh, uh, that needs to be. Uh, we will, when people don't show up for their uh, uh, exams, uh, it's important for them to uh, come in when they're supposed to. Come. Uh, I think social media has been a, a big help in uh, uh, finding people who uh, uh, are doing things that they shouldn't be capable of doing. Uh, people like to post amazing things. Uh, so uh, if uh, they have it out there, that's fair game for anybody uh, to see. And uh, a picture is worth a thousand words or, or more. People like to show off. That's helpful as uh, we heard earlier from John. I've had very uh, little luck with uh, surveillance. Uh, over the years, I've viewed uh, many uh, surreptitious uh, videos of people doing things. And uh, there's one or two cases where I could clearly say this person uh, wasn't acting appropriately. Most of the time, uh, this poor guy is sitting in a car videotaping and, and you see somebody walk down the street and then they walk back down the street. It's hard to say uh, much about that unless this person's supposed to be in a wheelchair. Uh, it, it, I don't think that there's much uh, value in that. Uh, and uh, again, speak with the provider, uh, exchanging concerns that you have, and the provider can also uh, uh, let you know that they have concerns. Okay, I guess we're gonna have the uh, questions uh, later.
Yes. I do have I do have one question. Um, John alluded to his presentation. What's your favorite story of bus? <laughs> well, there was one that recently happened where I was seeing somebody with a, uh, a you know, the story, a, a shoulder injury. During the exam, he couldn't raise his arm uh, above uh, 90 degrees. And uh, so I saw him and we had a plan in place. And uh, I said, okay, we, we have to go out to the front desk. And he puts his coat on. <laughs> and I pointed at him and said, you're full duty. <laughs> So that was, uh, and he, he didn't he didn't say anything. <laughs> Some of you who attend this group regularly may remember me. I don't have my bio with me today, and I said to Scott, I think by now they know who I am. Uh, I absolutely love being back with this group again. I love the uh, energy and enthusiasm for learning uh, with this group and how you can better serve your workplaces and your employees. So it's an honor to be back here again. And I hope we get a lot of questions uh, during the, the Q&A. So I'll uh, watch, watch uh, my time here. We lawyers are not known for being uh, succinct. So, uh, all right, so some strategies for combating workers' comp abuse legally. So just to give you a, somewhat of a background on who the attorneys are in this in this system, they'll usually have for larger organizations general counsel. And that would be uh, such as myself. I am general counsel to a few organizations. They would contact me for risk management concerns more on the front end and to guide them through uh, the workers' comp life cycle, but more from the organization perspective. When uh, somebody's actually out litigating the case for your organization, that is typically the workers' comp attorney who's assigned by the carrier. So a lot of the litigation in this end is done more by other types of attorneys who work specifically for the carrier. My role is risk management. So I get the pleasure of working with people just like you every day on how to manage risk. So that's what I'm going to be talking to you about today. And I routinely get calls about, especially the frequent flyers, those employees who are still off watching the soaps, uh, in some cases over a year, Later, I see this more in the circumstance where a client will actually have a paid leave policy where they will pay an employee's full salary for the entire time the employee's on leave. That's kind of asking for it in the workers' comp sense. Uh, so my role is generally managing, managing the risk. So I'll give you a few tips in risk management. First of all, consistent enforcement of a workers' comp policy. We heard John from HMK gave, gave a great informative presentation. And uh, part of what he said was uh, consistently enforcing a procedure. And so from a legal standpoint, that would be a policy that is part of your daily operations in either your personnel handbook or your, your policy manual. So first of all, I can't stress enough and completely agree uh, with John as to prompt reporting. Pennsylvania has a more employee friendly law for you know those of you Pennsylvania employers you probably are not surprised where Pennsylvania actually allows workers comp claims to be based on exacerbation of a pre-existing injury something that occurred outside the workplace that is some states have that some states don't you're in one that does that's part of the reason why we recommend prompt reporting sometimes and I think John John touched on this because you'll have employees who might be working in third shift they claim they have an injury that nobody saw Prompt reporting is often better managed in your first line of defense, your management. So for example, we had a client whose uh, very young employee uh, sustained a concussion on the job. It was a mental health facility and the person tried to res restrain a child and had a concussion. And it was not reported just because this young employee had no idea that you report those types of injuries and didn't wanna be a problem. Uh, so didn't, didn't say anything. Management's really your first line of defense and prompt reporting. We recommend uh, 24 hours, you must, within 24 hours of the injury, you must get an incident report uh, submitted in writing to management so that your claim can be reported to the carrier. We want to know exactly when that injury happened and have a written incident report on file. Uh, secondly, getting the employee back to work. It is real. Whether you want it, whether you look at it as the employee falling into depression, there are some people more sympathetic to it, might look at it as the employees at home, uh, they fall into a depression. Really, 
you know, what once they're at home, it's very hard to get them to come back because they're used to a, uh, a daily routine of being able to get up and do what they want to do. It's hard to get them back into work. So we always recommend a policy of, uh, of uh, light duty. And this was also touched on, touched on earlier. Your light duty assignment does not have to be part of what the employee typically does. In the case of one of our clients, they had somebody who typically was a salesperson working on the phones uh, and obviously was paid then the rate that was appropriate for that job. Uh, zero tolerance for fraud. Um, fraud should be uh, right up front on your policy. We'll usually recommend putting zero tolerance language language right up front in your policy to make it clear that your organization does not tolerate fraud. So one quick word though, a little caveat on the employee handbook before I move on. Uh, I work with a lot of organizations ranging from five employees to over 2000. And I would never tell a small family business you need to have an employee handbook. Usually one of the most critical things for an employer, uh, notwithstanding employee handbook is job descriptions job descriptions. And that goes back to some of what both of the speakers uh, talked about, that when you're working with a physician, whether it be for workers' comp or any other purpose, they need to know exactly what the employee is intended to do at the job. That's critical for many different risk management issues, more so than even your employee handbook. Uh, most of your legal risk management can be um, uh, at least reduced in a few areas, particularly workers' comp and uh, ADA, Americans with Disabilities Act, by having job description. So this is not a plug for an employee handbook, but just simply a, a policy or a procedure. Early intervention through light duty. I think that this was discussed many times. Hopefully, if any of you take, hopefully if you take anything away from the presentations today, it's the importance of having light duty assignments that employees can come back to. Are you obligated? I get that question all the time. Am I legally obligated to create light duty positions? No, it's just in your, it's just in your best interest. Um, and uh, likewise, under the ADA, you Americans with Disabilities Act, if you have an injured employee who would also qualify as quote unquote disabled under the ADA, you're likewise not obligated to bring them back through light duty. This is different than a reasonable accommodation. You're not obligated. However, it is helpful. send job offer notices. I think this was touched on uh, in the HMK presentation, the importance of obtaining legal counsel, either through the employer's general counsel like me or through the insurance carrier's uh, counsel. Usually I, I will be contacted just to give you a practical point. I'm usually contacted at this point by the uh, workers comp carrier to assist with the job offer notice process. Uh, this can be part of your offer of a light duty assignment. There are certain legal elements for the job offer notice. That's why we do not recommend that employers try to do this phase. This is so important to your legal risk management to have all of the elements of the appropriate job offer notice met, just to make sure that this is actually going to protect you. And there are certain elements that are provided in the workers comp statute. So after you send out the job offer notice, if the offer fits within the employee's restrictions, employee does not accept your offer and you're looking at minimizing risk you're looking at work working with the workers comp uh, assigned carrier to go out and file either a suspension or a termination uh, petition for you with the workers comp judge and again that wouldn't be through your in-house legal counsel or general legal counsel that would be through contacting your carrier and obtaining assistance from the carrier you want them to pay for that right you don't that that's why you have workers comp so that they can pay for some of those expenses for um, so knowing what you can do, uh, many employers, I, I think we discussed this uh, when we were all preparing for this presentation, a lot of employers don't know what they can do, what they are able to do. You are able to create and pay for light duty position. You are able to investigate uh, claims. And uh, as was stated earlier, I loved John's statement that surveillance is not fruitful unless it would produce some type of evidence. That's part of what I wanted to talk to you about today. What is evidence? So secondly, that's what you can do. Um, and you can also work with your carrier to, to uh, file petitions to either modify or terminate the worker's comp. That's something your carrier would work with you on. And you can terminate the employee for legitimate business reasons. A lot of employers are under the misimpression that if an employee, once an employee has that workers' comp claim, what's their, 
at, at either at home watching the soaps or working and, and somehow being paid out through the workers' comp system that now they cannot be terminated. You absolutely may terminate an employee. You cannot terminate them because they filed a claim. However, you can terminate them for legitimate business reasons. Let me give you an example. So let's say that you have an employee who's on some type of intermittent leave due to workers' comp problem. So they're out on a worker on a work-related injury. So they're receiving workers' compensation. And part of their light duty assignment or part of their workers' comp restrictions is that they need to have intermittent leave. Your employer policy says that the employee needs to call in prior to the workday to inform the employer that they will not be there due to leave. And you have an employee on in a workers' comp uh, leave scenario who is not following your call-off policy. We can follow your progressive discipline policy or whatever your, your typical policy is under most circumstances. And you may terminate that employee. You're not terminating them because they uh, filed a workers' comp claim. You're terminating them because they violated your other policy. So how to conduct a useful investigation. Um, again, this is something that you would want to work with your, your carrier on because this does tend to come out of the, the employer's coffers under most situations. So we want to make sure that it's fruitful and it's something that the carrier would be able to use, but just a word on what that evidence is. These claims or these uh, efforts that you make are not fruitful unless you are able to collect some kind of evidence. What is that? For an investigation to produce evidence, first of all, it must be fact-based. It cannot be based on someone's speculation about what may be occurring with the employee. It can't be based on someone's preference. It needs to be based on the specific facts of uh, the the employee situation and also on observable evidence. So for example, let's say you have an employee who is claiming to be completely disabled and uh, can't return to work, but then you find out that they're at some kind of a training. Well, I, that sometimes that can make, I, I've heard of that scenario many times, the employer gets upset when they find out that the employee is at some other type of professional uh, situation when they're claiming to be laid up at home. Before you get too worked up about that, you would want to look back and see what are the employee's restrictions? Are they acting within their restrictions? Because they very, very well may be. More probative than prejudicial, what this means from the lawyer's standpoint, is it has to be more likely to actually prove your case that the employee is not actually injured in the way they're claiming to be. It can't just be about making the employee look bad. And then finally, must be done lawfully. So how to lawfully investigate? I'll talk to you about Surveillance, it's not always lawful. It depends on how you do it. Same with social media postings. Uh, IME reports. IME reports can be useful in uh, issuing your return to work notices. That, in fact, that's pretty much a, the direct path that I see with my clients is they receive an IME report indicating that the employee has had some restrictions lifted. So at that point, then they can begin to determine whether there's a light duty assignment available or whether the employee can even return part time. Uh, to their position, trustworthy eyewitnesses and employee admissions. I'm, I am used to be surprised. I'm not surprised anymore at how often we can get employee admissions. And actually, Dr. Dolphin gave a really good example of the employee lifting up their arm, just basically physically admitting that they can do what they're saying they cannot do. So how to obtain evidence legally. The word here is evidence. So to be, evi to be evidence, it has to actually be admissible in a legal proceeding. First of all, must clearly show the employee. And I think actually Dr. Dolphin mentioned that, that oftentimes surveillance is not fruitful because when the physician looks at the, the video footage, they say, well, you know, you can't even really tell what you're doing here. This might even fit within their restrictions. So you have to be able to clearly show the employee uh, the MMA fight was a great example. You get the employee on, on videotape in like some type of a, a combat situation, you know, I, that could absolutely show uh, that the employee's not following their, their cannot be obtained through trickery or deceit. So this is this is important. Uh, we attorneys call you have to be able to lay a foundation for evidence in court. And what that means is you have to be able to show sort of a logical path on how, how you got that evidence. For those of you who like to watch lawyer shows, I can't watch lawyer shows because I start sweating when they miss their <laughs> objections. 
But um, for those of you who like to watch lawyer shows, you'll kind of see that in court, how they show the, the pattern of how the person got the evidence. So it's not just the evidence itself that's important, it's how you got it. So an example of, of trickery, and this might be kind of benign, but the employer posing as someone else is an easy way to friend them on Facebook. Example of trickery, and actually lawyers can't do that. It's actually against our ethical rules. So as an attorney, I couldn't do that you know, no matter what. Uh, but you as the employer, if you pose as someone else to get the employee to friend you on Facebook, that you really can't use that ultimately in court. That would be obtained through trickery or deceit. The employee's attorney could probably object and get that uh, not used in evidence. Uh, if there are, there is, however, a lot of uh, a lot of pictures, a lot of postings that are available publicly. Also, if you have other employees who are in management, might already be friends with this person on Facebook or social media. You can get uh, the pictures that way. Um, you must be able to have a verifiable date, time, place, and source. I had a client who got into trouble with this recently. Uh, all their pictures and evidence were obtained at a time that they, they don't even remember. They had a, a whole stack of pictures. They don't remember when they took the pictures or who took the pictures or where. In that case, they can easily be uh, objected to. Uh, no deceptive editing for any reason. You may think it's okay to take just a clip or a snippet. We see this in politics all the time where you take just an isolated part of what somebody said, even if there was no intention to deceive, it can, as we know, give an entirely new meaning to what that person said. So even if your reasoning is not necessarily deceptive, there can be no editing for any reason in order to get uh, video footage or some type of footage, particularly photographic evidence. Finally, you cannot enter onto an employee's private property. You may think that's a no-brainer, but there are actually several cases about this litigated all across Pennsylvania. You can actually surveil an employee in their backyard. You can. There are cases like that where an employer was successful in surveilling an employee on their property, but only when they can see the employee plain, in plain view can actually enter on the employee's private property in order to obtain Thank you for your attention. I don't think I, I don't think I went over. Did I? So, all right. Well, I look forward to your questions in Q and A. Thank you. Okay, this is Scott again. We are going to, uh, we're getting set up here to do Q&A. Uh, while the presentations were going on uh, online, we had a couple questions uh, that came across. Uh, so I'm going to start with, I have two, so I'm going to start with those. Uh, Aaron's in the back monitoring other questions that those of you on the WebEx may have. Uh, just enter it in that chat and, and uh, Aaron will read them out. And then, of course, everyone here, you know, uh, show your hand or raise your hand. And uh, Jen is playing Phil Donahue for those who are old enough to remember that. And uh, she'll she'll bring around the microphone. So the first question is, uh, how can you control prompt reporting when Pennsylvania doesn't support it by allowing 180 days to report? You can discipline, but it doesn't help with the claim. I would uh, anybody can answer, but I would. Have... Okay, so just yes, yes. Okay, so excellent question, and I I have gotten this question numerous times. I have struggled with this issue myself. It's not uh, an aspect of the law that employers uh, it, it's uh, necessarily favorable to. Uh, yes, that work for the employer does need to be made in a company based on time frame. I'm frank on that. 180 days is too long. Uh, but that's not really what I'm talking about in my presentation. So in your policy, where you by policy require an employee to report within 24 hours, that's not any, that doesn't have anything to do with the report that you as the employer make to the carrier. That is your requirement, your organizational requirement, that an employee report a claim within 24 hours. Therefore, if you are applying that standard to all claims, if an employee fails to report within 24 hours, they have then violated your organizational policy. And that could have relevance to their employee employment status, not necessarily terminated. That would have that would have relevance to their status as an employee and whether or not they've complied with your state. 
standard for management. Management sees somebody, for example, we just had this recently, management saw uh, an elderly woman fall during the day. She got embarrassed, she said, don't report. My advice to management was, you must file that incident. So, in a way, that's more of an, of an internal policy. So there is a distinction between the report to the carrier and your organizational requirements where you hold your management staff accountable for making sure that incident report gets in when it's 24, and certainly no later than 40 hours. Thank you. I'm, I'm sure whatever, whatever, you, whatever, <laughs> with that time. It's still a long time. So, so the legal distinction I'm making here is between the report from the employer to the carrier, which is a certain number of days required by statute. Versus the report that management is required by organizational policy to make through the use of your incident report. Thank you. Uh, the we we heard from people in the WebEx that the microphones aren't working as well as we'd like. So when you're answer, I'll repeat the questions that are asked here, but when you answer, you can project as much as possible. That's why I wasn't stalking, but that's why I kind of slid the podium over to pick up there. Okay. Uh, yeah, John's like, hi. Right um, <clears throat> the next question, when you, and I think this one is, by the way, these questions may be geared towards one person, but feel free to uh, jump in. This one, I think, is geared more towards Keeley. Again, when you terminate someone, don't you have to continue to give them workers' comp benefits until a judge says you can stop? Yes. Yes. Okay. So there, this, again, is a distinction between your internal organizational policy versus how the workers operate. And there is uh, something called a termination petition. It typically be filed by the carriers assigned legal counsel. A termination petition is a petition that's filed the workers comp judge to have the employee's right to uh, workers comp terminated. The other type of termination is the termination of the employee's employment. That has absolutely nothing to do with the workers' comp judge. A workers' comp judge cannot tell you that you must maintain employment or that you must terminate. That is completely up to your discretion as an employer. Um, oftentimes, in the more difficult situation, they'll have an agreement where the employee agrees to resign and waive all claims as part of a workers' comp settlement. But still, there's, those two systems are not intertwined in the sense that any workers' comp judge can tell you as an employer that you have to terminate your legal counsel. That means you have a legitimate, uh, non discriminatory or retaliatory. Okay. Uh, Jen has uh, the next question, then we're going to come up front here. Uh, starting like these, what about the reduction in additional risk? So I get that a lot, um, especially for that employee that you don't want to come back. We're talking about liability claim. Um, my advice is to still bring them back to work. That that offer of light duty um, is the key to you moving this claim forward. I think the risk of them re-injuring themselves um, is limited. Um, Put in measures to, you know, make sure you're checking in on them, put them in a position where they're uh, not going to injure themselves again or create an issue. But I think the risk is greater in letting them stay home um, and continue to collect benefits and create havoc that way than actually bring them back in. I, in my 25 years of doing this, I can't think of maybe what one instance where someone re injured themselves uh, when they were. Okay. Uh, My question is for John. You had mentioned earlier about insurance. There is some buzzing about for a while. Are we talking about going to a phone for $3 when it's a provider? Where it won't just happen? Yeah. 
Yeah. Before you answer yeah. this, uh, for those who may not have heard the question, it was just asking John to go a little bit uh, more in depth on uh, what when he spoke earlier about triaging uh, injuries before they actually make it. Uh, she asked what that looks like a little more in depth. Yeah, so there are um, some really good third party providers out there. Uh, one that I can think of off the top of my head is called NT24 Nurse Triage 24, NT24 7, sorry, um, where the, the first report of injury actually goes to an RN, takes the information, triages the situation there, and provides you know, next steps, which could be, hey, why don't you just take it easy for a couple hours and take a couple aspirin and we'll see how you feel, to, no, we really need you to get you to an emergency room right now. Um, perfectly legal under the statute. Um, I have some employers who um, maintain an RN um, on premises, either paid or unpaid, um, and those individuals will triage the, um, the and, and provide the same type of it has a significant impact. Uh, it will reduce the number of um, indemnity claims that you're going to pay. Good morning. My name is Elisa. I work at Shumbright. And we employ a large number of miners. So my question is more geared towards the How do we handle our miners to be able to plant? To uh, make sure everyone heard that, the question uh, was when they employ minors, uh, how is that uh, different from to be uh, medically and legally compliant uh, with the treatment of minors? All right, so uh, Elisa, okay, thank you very much for your question. And actually, when you said minors, I was thinking, I was thinking minors, I didn't mind. Uh, <laughs> yeah. uh, you mean, uh, under so uh, just just to ask you about that, so uh, a little bit more in place still in the law. So in that case, you may need to contact the employee's parent uh, if the employee has an injury on the job. So John uh, from HFK during his presentation he talked about the employer accompanying the employee to the to the to the position. Perfectly legal and fine. You don't have employees. Almost like they're on the cop show, but then they're shouting, I know my first amendment rights. They'll, they'll say, HIPAA, HIPAA. No, that's not your legal obligation. Uh, going back to the situation of minors, you may need to contact a parent or guardian to also accompany the because you need that. In some cases, depending on the age of the child, they cannot consent. So you might need uh, a parent or guardian to accompany them. That's the only legal difference I think is Dr. Uh, Dalton. In, in order for us to figure out what happened. All right. We can't, we can't take care of it. Just to add to the point about HIPAA, we don't usually let uh, supervisors into the handle of the issue. We're happy to. On, on the war story front, I've heard some pretty interesting standoffs by supervisors insisting to come in the uh, exam room uh, and us not allowing. Uh, just, just a quick uh, comment and follow up. Um, it's my advice to employers to let the physician decide the HIPAA discussion because the HIPAA obligation is there. So, Dr. Dolph and Dr. Pelosi, they get the obligation to the employer. So, you're going to want to listen to them and be guided by. As the boundary. Okay. Other questions? Right there, Jen, right in front of you. I'm going in my and work with Health Works. And my question is um, uh, to the last one. Uh, the universal legality and HIPAA. What if a person gets injured? Do you have a person? What are the 
The question, question. Still one second, just to make sure the question was heard, it was uh, what is the uh, HIPAA regulations for first responders at the company who, who may be the first ones on site to an injury as to what are they allowed to ask in terms of HIPAA? Yes, okay, excellent question. So your response there is actually guided by the American Patients Act. Generally speaking, so you're not going to ask Uh, the Americans with Disabilities Act applies certain parameters to the questions that you may have, regardless of whether you have this actually is a service. Questions need to be limited to what's specifically necessary in that situation. So you show up, you have an employee who's with the VA, your questions are going to be different than if you show up and the employee has uh, a disability. You want to be guided by, you don't just go asking anything, you don't ask them for a full benefit. Be guided by what your specific moment and what the specific what the necessity is. And just for those of you, uh, Lorianne, uh, a nurse with uh, LVHN Health Work, but Lorianne is uh, actually uh, permanently placed at a company. Uh, as someone mentioned before, having a uh, uh, a company having their own nurse to help triage. That's actually what Lorianne's job is at one of our uh, large companies in the valley. But she gets paid. Yeah, she does. <laughs> yeah, I don't know when you said of uh, whether a paid or voluntary. I was yeah, trying I, to figure I, out where I, you got I, these volunteer I, nurses. I, 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 have a, I have a situation <laughs> and they're sitting in the room. I'm not going to point it out. There's a very easy thing. <laughs> Thank you. 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 Down the road, I think four times I saw all causes of cases. Um, I've attended countless depositions and kick the can down the road to talk to people. And unfortunately, you know, for us in the in the construction industry, the spirits mod is our lifeblood for future work. And although I don't necessarily agree that it is a leading indicator, the industry says it is. So with all of that said, have you ever been involved in any kind of cases where individual has been proven, uh, but by the time that actually has been done, it's been months down the road, 3,500 has been spent. Has it ever, ever been involved in a case where you were able to pack that out of an employer's mind? Does that make sense? Yeah, the question makes sense, but I don't know. I think that sadly, the industry has lost our health and that only so I can't can't point to a where someone's been convicted of fraud and then th those dollars are paid, right? Correct. There's no subrogation. It's usually the individual that is committing that fraud. They're not going to have the resources for the carrier to subrogate back again. I'm going to kind of answer your question. There is a mechanism for the carrier if they can recover those funds that have been paid. Can be your, your mod can be retroactively affected by that. The problem is you need to do it within a window, and I believe it's two years. And a lot of times these things go so far beyond right, that it's it's a moot point. It's been done, but it's hard. I, 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 sorry, I don't have a better answer for it. Okay, thank you. I mean, you know, I, I often encourage folks, and I, and I just maybe find this guy, but you know. The, the work comp statute is, is a, has been adjusted over the years, right? It's been made more employer friendly. There's been several changes to the statute. Um, you know, your uh, associations, organizations, lobbying groups, um, if this is important to you, those are things that the legislature can respond to. And if they're not put under any pressure to make any change, they won't. And usually when they get pressured is when rates are going up, then everybody freaks out, right? Now we need something done. Um, there, there are things like you're talking about that don't really hit everybody, but are significant to your, your business, right? Um, so that said, um, it, your broker as well can get involved there. I've, I've been successful where we maybe had a mod that wasn't great, 
Um, and we've laid out our history, a detailed history of what drove that mod up. A lot of times the, the, your client or the general contractor will accept that. Um, there are a lot of, some of it's hard and fast, I know, um, but there are some other vehicle things. And I'm sorry to do this to our panel, but I'm getting a lot of um, a lot of notes here that people just can't hear. So if I could ask you when it's your time to talk, just come up here. Uh, that would help. We do have uh, a question uh, that came in online. Uh, whoever wants this one can start first. But the question is, what is the legitimate medical community doing to combat the waste, fraud, and abuse by the, quote, player doctors? <laughs> All right, Dr. Dolphin's taking it. Nothing. No. <laughs> well, that was seriously the answer? Okay. Uh, <laughs> I have no knowledge of any action to go forward. These are providers in the community who are known uh, uh, to uh, be uh, friendly to folks who may have a, another agenda, and I, I know of no. Uh, plan or uh, activity to put an end to that. I may, someone else may answer. They're not, they should come up. Uh, give us a minute, Our uh, one of our case managers at HealthWorks, actually all of our case managers I think are here, but one of our case managers is gonna come up and answer that. Stacey, if you don't mind coming up, people can't hear really well from that. <laughs> <laughs> Didn't happen to work though. <laughs> Didn't have that work. Exercise isn't all it's cracked up to be. Um, I just wanted to um, kind of elaborate on what Dr. Dolphin said um, and actually go back in the presentation when they talk about communication. Uh, huge and the panel, huge. Um, it's the providers and the case managers who know every name in the valley, almost every name. If we haven't heard the name, that's a sign. Um, if there, there are a lot of names that we know that lawyers specifically go to these providers. So if you're working on your panel or if you are trying to figure out, you know, what to do with these employees and where to send them, call us. Even if we're not treating that uh, patient, you can call us and say, hey, do you know anything about this doctor in the Valley? Um, one of my employees is going to them. We can certainly give our insight as much as possible in the situation and help you guide you in the right direction. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, let me just quick see if we had any. Is there any other questions? Oh, they said thank you for that. Uh, oh, I'm sorry. It's the microphone. And again, um, if you have an employee who is on leave and the doctor on the restrictions for not saying no you can offer them the work to be on um, the life duty role in an overtime request and they work overtime and they're on duty. The question was can an employee who's on light duty work overtime? The reason why I'm asking that is um, we have a case where we're paying a supplemental amount of overtime because the person is working for injury. And work a lot of overtime, and, and now they're on a workman's comp case, and we're paying a supplemental overtime for them not working overtime. And if they work one hour of overtime, that goes away. The further elaboration is they have a person on on uh, light duty or on workers' comp. I'm sorry that. Uh, had a significant amount of overtime, and they are actually paying that difference based on the uh, amount of overtime they've had. But it would actually go away as soon as the person works any sort of overtime while on life. Whoever, whoever is up here. Okay, so I just want to clarify the question one more time. So the individual before the injury worked overtime. Now that the individual is working a light duty position, they are not typically working overtime, but still getting paid a premium amount because they used to work overtime. Okay, that actually, I'm not going to tell you from a legal standpoint that's illegal or anything like that. But what that's doing is it's going beyond your legal obligation to pay for the position, and it's encouraging the person not to work overtime. If the in person actually, if the overtime premium goes away, 
when the person actually works overtime, it's a financial disincentive that you're not legally obligated to do unless there's a union contract or other contract that speaks to the issue. So let me just ask you, is there a union contract or employment contract that applies here? So it sounds like wage loss that you're talking about wage loss. Right. Okay. So they're considering it wage loss because now the loss of overtime. Um, but yet it's pretty much the same. Mm -hmm. But my question was if if I do not overtime and somebody else does not from a legal standpoint, absolutely, you can have them work overtime, provided that that's within their restriction. So, and also from a legal standpoint, you can pay for the position. I will I'll let my my colleague for HM, from HMK talk to you about the wage loss part of this, because as attorneys, we don't really deal with that. It sounds like there might be a little bit of confusion there between the hourly rate versus the wage loss part of the claim. So, Okay. Uh, let me uh, turn this over to John from HMK because it sounds like you're talking there about wage loss. I I spoke to what I spoke to your legal obligations as to what you need to pay the employee. You just need to pay for the job as long as the overtime's within their restrictions. They can work have them work whatever is within their restrictions. But I'm going to let uh, John speak to the wage loss because I really don't deal with that. Yeah, so normally what we hear is that darn employee is getting paid way too much. They were overtime before they got injured. Now they aren't working overtime, but we're still they're still getting compensated their pre-injury wage, right? So that's a very unique um, situation. Uh, um, Kaylee's assessment of your legal obligation um, they're obviously permitted to work overtime. It, it negatively affects them. The carrier, the carrier that uh, that the statute is what it is. So if if they begin to work overtime and it offsets that pre-injury wage, there's really nothing you can do about that. I guess my question would be, and I don't know how much overtime does the overtime equate to what they would be giving up. On the comp payment or no? Wouldn't be. That's it. I wish I could tell you bring them back and but if they're if they're being put in a position where I don't know why they would want to do that. I understand why you need them to do that, um, but I think it would be pretty hard to compel somebody to, to give that up. If I if I could just jump in, uh, I see we're a couple minutes over. There was one other question I at least want to get to, and and I believe everyone's going to stick around a little bit afterwards for any uh, maybe continue that conversation or or any uh, one on one questions you might have. But uh, Chris, did I see you had a question there? Just the, the repeat of the question there is uh, it was similar to the previous question, but it referred to shift differential 24 operate uh, 24 hour operation. They get extra compensation for shift differential, but under if they're on workers comp and they move them to a different shift, then they would lose that shift differential income. And uh, the question was how that should be addressed from an insurance point of view. So um, I don't, that's no different than 
in my opinion, then the where you're offering someone a position at a lower pay scale that you're compensated less for the for the uh, responsibilities. They are entitled to what they made pre injury, right? But you don't have to compensate them. The carrier would pick up the difference. I would definitely have that conversation with your work comp carrier. Okay, uh, since we are a couple minutes over, like I said, we'll be hanging around to answer questions best we can. Uh, normally we do uh, an OSHA, a quick OSHA update, uh, but Scott Shamandel's waving his hand saying, ah, there's nothing that important. Just kidding, he didn't say nothing that important, but he's gonna defer just for the sake of time. So uh, Lucinda, if you can pop up, we always just do a little uh, door prize for those of you who made the trek out here. Um, we have a, a gift card, John, if you wanna pull a name out of the bag. Uh, and while that's happening, uh, for those of you in the WebEx, thank you for joining us. Uh, thank you everyone for joining us. We have all the contact information. You will get a copy of the presentation along with a survey in the next couple of days. It'll come from Tyler. Uh, we encourage you to fill it out and let us know any suggestions or if you would like to speak on a topic at a future meeting. And the winner is Tanya from ServePro. Tanya from ServePro. Congratulations. Thank you everyone for coming.